can record it. No, it's can't do it at the moment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special session we are having today on women in science, for which we have a woman scientist with us over here, Margarita Safanova, a very good friend and a very good scientist. And uh, we are happy to have Rita with us today to celebrate women in science. So first of all, let me introduce Rita to all of you all. Rita was born in Russia, as you expected. She lives here in Bangalore in... Uh, uh, she works in the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore, but lives in the IIC campus. So uh, Rita actually got her MSc in Physics from the Moscow State University and a PhD in Astrophysics from Delhi University in 2002. She's worked in Cambridge, UK, in Tehran, Iran. And since 2006, she's been working at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. Her broad interests are gravitational lensing and cosmology, ultraviolet astronomy from space, exoplanets, astrobiology, and uh, <clears throat> we're really happy to have Rita with us today. And uh, so Rita, you can tell us something before we start. Well, uh, hello. Space is the final frontier and everybody loves astronomy. And of course, the biggest show on earth is actually in the night sky. But why do we need to go to space? Well, as Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the famous uh, Russian astrophysicist, scientist, and actually the father of the rocket equation said, Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one cannot remain in the cradle forever. The same goes for everyone. We want to go to space. We want to colonize, explore space. But astronomers, same. Astronomers also want to go to space to do astronomy. Why it is so? In my presentation and my talk today, I will try to explain some of the reasons of why we need to go to space and some of the experiments that our group at Indian Institute of Astrophysics is doing. So we're also trying to send our instruments to space. Yeah. You're so, welcome. problems with connectivity. We have a recorded talk, but Rita is with us. So please post your questions in the chat window and uh, we'll answer them after the video is shown to you, right? So um, let us uh, first watch the video and... When we think about space, we imagine space to be empty. At least we know that there is a moon, but between the Earth and the moon, there is nothing. But is space really empty? First, we live with a very active star, which throws billions of tons of matter out into space at millions of kilometers per hour. This is the origin of the so-called space weather. So between the sun and the earth, there is lots of things. And so much that uh, the near earth space is incredibly crowded. And of course, there are photons. Photons come to us in all ranges of electromagnetic spectrum. Gamma rays from supernovae, black holes, X-rays, usable all that we see in the sky. Infrared, radio, microwave, which universe itself, the Big Bang shines. And of course, there are things outside the electromagnetic spectrum, like gravitational waves, neutrinos, cosmic rays, and of course, meteoroids. So actually, the universe bombards us with information. But why go to space? When the biggest show on Earth every night played for everyone for free is the night sky. By the way, I hope somebody will answer me. Tell me what the last 
to images where they were made on Earth. But there are reasons why we go to space. Of course, not exactly the recent reasons like this, that Starlink satellites now started to prevent us to observe in the actual night, clear night sky. There are also there are lots of junk now in the near Earth orbits. And of course, one of the reasons is that as uh, aptly expressed Larry Neven, the dinosaurs became extinct because they didn't have a space program. It is estimated there are about 25,000 near-Earth objects larger than 140 meters and 1,000 larger than 1 kilometer. And, but we are aware of only about 1% of them. Means that at any moment, asteroid can enter atmosphere and cause widespread destruction. We can track them somewhat from Earth, but tracking from space. This is, for example, animation of the NASA Neowise Wild Field Infrared Survey Explorer. These are discoveries in just three years. And this is a space telescope mapping the near Earth objects. And of course, there are other problems observing from the ground, like what we call seeing. Turbulence in the atmosphere causes images to blur. Increase in telescope size increases the depth. Of course, the faint objects can be seen, but not the resolution. Generally, bigger telescopes and resolution no better than just 0.1 meter telescope. And there are more earthly problems. Dust, smoke pollution, light pollution, moon and clouds, the weather, temperature changes and affects optics, traffic noises affect gravitational wave antennas, radio phones, even microwave oven affects radio telescopes. But the main reason, of course, is the atmospheric transparency, or sometimes we call it atmospheric opacity. It's good for us living on the ground that atmosphere actually absorbs most of the high energy radiation like gamma rays, X-rays and ultraviolet, but it's not very good for astronomers. That is why we have to go to space because across electromagnetic spectrum things look different. The same galaxy like this, for example, Whirlpool galaxy at different wavelength ranges look different because different wavelengths reveal different physics. So for X-ray astronomy, we have to go out to, of the atmosphere. X-ray astronomy has to be done from satellites. This is, for example, NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, named after the Indian scientist Chandra Sikar. Gamma ray astronomy. This is the image of the Compton Gamma ray Observatory. Infrared astronomy, Spitzer. This is the image of the infrared telescope Spitzer. And of course, India launched in 2015 AstroSat, which is multi-wavelength space astronomy mission, which has X-ray, optical and near UV spectral bands. This is the actual view of the spe spacecraft with several telescopes in it. UV astronomy is one of the most exciting parts of the astrophysical spectrums uh, because most more absorption and emission lines is in this area in this area of the electromagnetic spectrum than in any other part. Understanding the physics of the objects requires UV spectra of the atomic emission lines to complement the imaging observations. In the imaging domain, UV sky is faint and the sources are few. That is why UV transient events, like for example objects from near Earth asteroids to supernova, they really stand out. Usually supernovae and optical are caught too late when the UV emission is already fading. So early detection of a UV flash is immensely important in understanding of the explosion mechanism. Here small and quick response telescopes on a CubeSat, NanoSats, they actually beat large mission, missions like Hubble or Galax. And also by monitoring sky in the UV, we can catch flares from destruction of stars by the black holes or from the M dwarf stars which are actually 75% in our neighborhood. But where is space? Outer space is defined as anything above Harman line. Below it fly balloons, sounding rockets, airplanes. But why planes cannot fly higher? 
Well, a plane can only fly if it, it is constantly traveling forward so that the wings can generate lift. The thinner the air, the faster the plane must fly to avoid stalling. So Karman calculated that above an altitude of roughly 100 kilometers, a vehicle would have to fly faster than the orbital velocity in order to derive sufficient aerodynamic lift from the atmosphere to support itself. So as Theodor von Karman expressed that below this line, space belongs to each country. Above this level, there will be free space. Space age began in October 1st in 1957 with the launch of the first artificial space satellite Sputnik 1. It was 83 kilograms. And the only instrumentation was a battery-powered radio transmitter and a thermometer. After three months, it fell back. Sputnik 2, launched in November 57, was bigger and had a dog, Laika. Sputnik 3 was launched in 58. It was already a 1.5-ton satellite containing a payload with scientific instruments for measuring the conditions in space. Americans were not sleeping either. In 57, they tried to launch embarrassingly small 1.6 kg satellite that exploded on the launch pod pad. Finally, in January 31st, 58, they launched the Explorer 1 that actually discovered Earth radiation belt. Payload was built by Professor Van Allen. That is why these radiation belts are now called Van Allen belts. After that, it just kept on going. Now, more than 3,000 artificial satellites orbit Earth, actually active satellites, not the debris, more than 20 of them scientific. But space comes at a cost. For example, the recent Perseverance mission costed about $2,725.5 billion. Just the launch costed $243 million. But what makes space astronomy expensive? Well, it is a hardware with a heritage and reliability. The size, for example, next generation uh, after the Hubble Space Telescope will, will have six meters nearer. And the launch. Launches are expensive. ISRO it, is itself charges more than $25 million for a launch. However, as show, this cartoon shows, big science does not necessarily have to be done by the big corporation. And big corporations can do actually little science. So science on the cheap. Small telescopes cameras on board balloons or sounding rockets are attractive because they are much cheaper and yet can yield substantial scientific output. The first UV spectrum of a quasar was actually obtained during a short rocket launch. Of course, there are CubeSats and NanoSats, but outer space missions are always one way. There is no return, no correction. It needs space-qualified equipment, and it still requires expensive launch. So in our institute, we decided in 2012 to start the Altitude Ballooning Program, design and development of astronomical instruments to use in near space, from small platforms, balloons, and eventually, hopefully, CubeSats or NanoSats. Recent technological advances resulted in major reduction in cost of all the involved components, from an expensive latex balloons to easily available lightweight, compact and simple operation microelectromechanical devices. What are the essentials for free floating flights? Free floating means release the balloon and it goes to stratosphere. Well, we need lots of permissions. Basic permissions go from the uh, Civil Aviation Ministry of Defense and Airports Authority of India that has to be applied at least a year before the beginning of the program. And every time we need local permissions from our airports nearby and we have to inform the above mentioned offices about the balloon launch at least two weeks in advance. Launches are only allowed after obtaining all the required NOCs and we can carry out the flights only on a certain local non-flying days. Currently, these are Sundays at 2 to 4 a.m., which is good for us as we are astronomers. What are the balloons that we use? We use latex balloons. They're also called weather balloons or sounding balloons. They're designed to reach about 35-40 kilometers and burst. They're quite cheap. We get our balloons from Pune. It's about 2,000 each. Easy to make handle, but they lift only 1 to 3 kg of payload. 
There are also plastic balloons, so-called zero pressure balloons. They can reach much higher, 50 kilometers, and float for hours. They're expensive, they're stitched on order, and they, but they can carry several tons. But because of that, they need special launch tower. For example, TFR in Hyderabad, TFR balloon facility, they use these plastic balloons. What about gas? Well, helium is considered the safest gas for filling, but however, it is very expensive and very scarce. We switch to hydrogen eventually. Lift is better, and gas is much cheaper. One cylinder of helium costs 20,000 rupees, while one, hyd one of hydrogen costs only 800, about. We use parachutes, of course, made of the nylon. Sometimes we connect several of them serially. Of course, we need flight termination unit. Balloons drift off with winds, and they can go sometimes once we had balloon which went into Arabic Sea, the Arabian Sea. So we designed two independent Arduino-based FTUs, flight termination unit, based on timer and one based on geofencing, GPS. FTU uses what is called thermal knife, the nichrome wire which heats when the current passes through it and it melts the plastic rope between the balloon and the parachute. Then we developed RPI, single ball computer, that reads and controls the sensors, calculates the system altitude, attitude, and generates control commands. It records the data and images, if we need them, at regular intervals. It keeps a record of housekeeping files to verify the performance of the sensors. It is a small size and it has a very low power consumption. Of course, what the, the sensors that we routinely launch, we always launch environmental sensors, temperature, pressure, humidity, attitude sensors, which comprise, comprise gyroscope, accelerometer, and a digital compass. Then, of course, we need cameras and the trackers. We use GSM, GPS, and the radio trackers. Batteries, we use only lithium polymer because they work in low temperatures. And one, two days before the launch, we calculate the balloon flight path based on the local the wind patterns. This is called flight path prediction. We use this particular software. Sometimes we use also our own codes in MATLAB and IDEA. This is a video of how the balloon is filled with the last year. The road and the payload. We use the gloves because balloons should not be touched the bare hands. The oil will leave the base and when the balloon is not outside. It has to expand uniformly. Otherwise, it will, it may rupture prematurely. And this is the real video of the launch, accelerated because it takes a long time, from our launch facility at Crest, which is about 30 kilometers from Bangalore. This was the test launch, that is why it, the sun is already rising. Some of our photographs from Stratosphere. We have two cameras usually, one looking up at the balloons to verify the, the conditions, and one looking horizontally at the horizon. Some instruments that we actually develop ourselves, the flight termination unit, data logger, radio tracker, radio decoder and attitude sensor. So our objectives are design, experiment, testing, science. Balloons go to the near space, above a zone layer that absorbs UV light. Balloons experiments are complementary to space-based instruments. We have quick response time. We can have a balloon launched within two weeks because of permissions. UV follow-up of transients from comets to supernova. We are testing and verifying operation of our payloads on the balloon flights, with the intention eventually placing them on small satellites. Going into space has the obvious advantage of longer mission life and the ability to go further into the far UV. 
there are only a handful of UV observations of the moon because the moon is so bright. We're actually planning to observe the moon both spectroscopically and with the image to track changes in the albedo at different phases. So some of the instruments developed by us, by our group, our students, for example, attitude sensor. This is the heart of all near outer space flights. They need to know the position and the location. Commercially available attitude sensors are very expensive, more than 50k rupees. So we have developed the off-the-shelf component-based sensor on the cheap using MEMS for miniaturization. It is comprises it comprises accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer to give Euler angles, which are later converted to array and deck using GPS data. Finally, it will be used in stabilization and pointing platform. This paper was cited uh, in the journal Science, saying that Shrijit, these are the students who actually worked on it, designed and built a microcomputer-based altimeter for high altitude light with balloons flight and astronomy. Then we need additional accuracy. Sun sensors are usually used by ballooning mini-satellite community for additional positional precision. But as we astronomers, we require night to observe. That is why we need something what is called star sensor. When astronomical observations are carried out at night, the bright stars in the sky are always visible. These bright stars are stationary and thus provide standard reference points. And we know them very well. We know the stars and the, all the bright stars and the sky, night sky very well. So these stars can be identified based on the pattern they form, and the final pointing position can be obtained using these known patterns. So a sensor which determines orientation by using this triangulation, so-called, is called a star sensor. Usually the accuracy from half degree to arc seconds. So we designed micro star sensor for the CubeSats. CubeSats we call it star berry sense. I'll explain why. We used open source and custom off-the-shelf codes components, and the codes are also open source. Various star sensors are made in the in the world, of course. The all the satellites use them, but they are really very expensive. They can cost anywhere above hundred thousand dollars, up to sometimes even five hundred thousand dollars. Our Starberry sense is cost just about sixteen hundred. These are the components used in it, which is Raspberry Pi camera and Raspberry Pi controller. That is why it's called Staberi. And lens system, power supply is custom design, and buffer wheel is going to be 3D printed. The function test will be uh, it will include vibration testing and thermovac testing, which is already been done for the UVIT, for the uh, instrument in uh, MJK Menon Laboratory at Crest in IA. We are also considering working on astrobiology. We are planning to make the sample, stratospheric altitude microbiology probe for life existence. So, since we go to a stratosphere anyway, conditions there resemble those on the surface of Mars. Levels of damage in UV radiation thousand times higher than at sea level, atmospheric pressure half percent of that at the sea level. Studies in that stratosphere can be a test run for looking for life in other worlds. In addition, we also want to try to collect micrometeorites. These are the parameters that we are planning to make. And what is more important that various collecting media is used in the world and even in space, aerogel, zero gel, and so on, and samples of air. But our microbe catcher will be very small. So we are planning to use agar. And as a collector, one of our students uh, proposed to use the old computer CD DVD drives, which can be extended on the command and then retracted back. About the agar, one of the uh, students in IIC made an experiment because, of course, we will when we go up, the temperature changes from plus 20, let's say, on the ground to minus 60 or minus 80 in stratosphere. So what 
and then come, coming back to plus 20. What will happen to agar when it freezes? And then it will flow away. So he made an experiment with the usual concentrations of 2 and 5% agar was actually really flowing away. But when 10% agar was found the most stable after the three freeze and thaw cycle. In addition, one of our students developed a stabilization and pointing platform. Again, the gimbals, which are usually used in aerial photography, like they cost about three lakhs at least. He designed and developed and we fabricated our own system, which took less than 10,000 rupees because it was also 3D printed on our <laughs> own 3D printer. In continuation with our idea on, of CubeSat compatible uh, instruments, we have developed uh, a wide field UV imager called NUTS, a UV transient surveyor that can be flown on a range of available platforms. So it has a wide field of view, 3 degrees, and a weight of only 4 kilograms. So it, it is specifically designed to fit into 6U CubeSat. We have several small payloads now that are ready to fly. And we have had serious discussions about flying them on our limited budget, but we haven't made the launch yet. However, as launch costs decrease and new initiatives appear, we hope that we'll have an opportunity to launch soon. And recently, indeed, such opportunities appeared. For example, ESRO announcement of opportunity for in-orbit scientific experiments on orbital platform PS4 to fly in 21-22, it was supposed to be 20, but delayed. And United Nations-China cooperation on the utilization of the China Space Station to supposed to fly in 2020-22. So what is this PS4 opportunity? PS4 orbital platform is a novel idea formulated by ISRO to use the spent PS4 stage, fourth stage of the PSLV, otherwise it will just orbit the Earth for about maybe up to six months and then just burn in the atmosphere. So they wanted to utilize this to carry out on orbit scientific experiments for this duration. The advantage being the stage that has its has standard interface and packages for power generation, telemetry, stabilization, orbit keeping and maneuvering. So we proposed to fly our star sensor, which is the small star sensor which I discussed previously just about 300 grams and it was accepted for the chinese station we proposed the actual telescope with a spectrograph chinese space station is the first station from china it's a stable platform for long-term observations never done any uv science from the space stations we selected a uv spectroscopy which we called sing spectroscopic investigation of nebula gas Planetary nebula, supernova remnants, interstellar medium, molecular clouds. And these are some of the accepted uh, payloads, one out, together with Russians. This is one of them. So, seeing we proposed in, actually a few V and N UV. So, but for space station, it is better to use N UV. So, this N UV thing on CSS, this is the model of the CSS, how it will fly. And our space, our place is on EM1, experimental module 1. And this is 3D rendering of the telescope, which is a tube. And here will be the spectrograph, GRISM, and the detector. This is the first time a telescope at all will be operating on a space station. Even ISS doesn't have telescopes. If you think we also submitted proposal to ESROM, but this is for 6U CubeSat. And we have the optical design and the model of the detector. This is still pe pending. We may even go to the moon, or we could have gone to the moon, but there is still hope. As you may remember, there was Google X Prize Foundation, which announced the moonshot, and Indian team Indus, uh, the Indian entry to that Google X Prize, they came to us and said, we have space on the lander. Do you want to fly anything to us? We were very happy. We said, yes, yes, of course, we will fly the UV telescope, which we called Lunar Ultraviolet Cosmic Imager, Lucy. 
It's actually interesting that originally we were told that we have 15 kilograms and we designed the 15 kilograms far UV telescope. Then, as time progressed, the limits were reduced to 7.5, and this is the first Lucy incarnation. Actually, optical design and everything was done for Luna FUV telescope. But, uh, and here it was supposed to be placed on the lander with the possible change of orientation. And this is the actual uh, model of the lander from Team Indus with our first prototype. We even featured on the Discovery Channel, our Lucy featured, the first incarnation of Lucy featured in the Discovery Channel. However, again, as time went by, the limits on the weight were reducing more and more, and finally with, I, we were told that weight shouldn't be more than 1.3 kilograms. Well, that limits aperture diameter, that limits detector choice, because the FUV detectors are heavy, that limits dimensions, and it limits the motor. We cannot now change the, our orientation. It's just single pointing. So here it's interesting. Usually when big space missions are planned, it, they define the science goals and then they develop the instruments from the science goals. Here it was the design concept that defined our science goals. We had to imagine with our limited uh, abilities with our lim limits on the, on the instrument, what can we do? And actually we decided to do an UV, near UV and study bright UV objects. It will be transit telescope, moon rotation is very slow, sky is very slow on, on the moon. So this is the design that we made, optical design. And uh, one more innovation was that we had to uh, develop, design the door, because as Lucy was supposed to fly for a long time to the moon for about two months, we cannot keep the optics open. So the door, how to open the door on the moon? And here the concept of the Nichrome Y, the same thermal knife as from our balloon system. Balloon, uh, this is our test as a current is passed through the Nichrome wire, the door opens. So why Lucy is unique? It's unique in the point of science. It can absorb bright UV sources because all the major space missions, UVAT, Galax, other UV absorbers, they cannot look at bright sources because their detectors can be damaged. Ours is a CCD, UV enhanced CCD, so we can actually look at the objects brighter than 12 magnitude. The weight, this is the lightest UV telescope possible, 1.2 kilograms. And of course, the cost is very small, with just less than $10,000, all, all spherical optical comp components, and no other, no other UV payloads have been reported with the all spherical optical design for imaging in the UV domain, and the weight below 2 kilograms. With our Lucy featured on the front page of Astrophysics Space Science Journal, and continuing with the NUV transient surveyor, now we also built it. This is the 3D model, 3D rendering of the NUV. And what we thought that it can also go to the moon, not only fly uh, on a CubeSat. Since center of gravity is here in the middle, we can actually adapt original Lucy idea design to rotate it and we can actually use it on the lunar land. Well, Lucy currently is in the storage box with regular grade 5 nitrogen purge in our MG Keminon lab, class 100 room, waiting for the launch together with nuts. Here is the photograph of the last photograph, open photograph of Lucy being put in the box. And this is the comparison with recent and future UV missions. If you look carefully, Comparing with Gallic and, Gallic and UVAT, of course, they're big missions, very expensive. Lucy and NUTS are small missions. Gallic's already decommissioned. In UVAT, only one channel is now active. Lucy and NUTS are ready to fly. And 
in in a point uh, regarding the weight as you can see 280 kilograms comparing to one and four kilograms and of course mission cost 150 million dollars six million dollars and less than ten thousand or about less than thirty thousand which shows that universities and institutes can actually do make very good instruments to fly them and we can really do good science thank you thanks rita that was a lovely talk rita put you can put on your video as well as your audio Hi, Rita. Okay. <laughs> that was a lovely talk. Thank you. And I think the most important take home message with this and this is that that's what most people are concerned about is that how can all of us also participate in space activities at a low cost, right? Yes. Because otherwise, if it's government agencies providing millions of dollars that we don't have access to that, right? So we have to look at things which are accessible. Which we can the same even goes for the data, because all the big missions data is proprietary and uh, it's at least one year before it can be released to the public. Well, this, our, our data, what we plan to do is release it immediately to the public. Any student can take it and, and do analyze it. Okay. Great, so uh, let's open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions from the others? Uh, if you want, you can unmute yourself and give your question, or you can type it in the chat window, as you wish. So I, I'll ask, so how much of, um, uh, you know, how much of uh, knowledge do, this, do people need to have so that they can actually start designing some things? Do they all have to be engineers, or what do they have to be so that they manage? Doing oh yes, of course. Um, to start designing by by itself, you need at least BSc in engineering or electronics or physics. But uh, to actually do some develop and make some astronomical payloads, of course, some astronomy knowledge is important. But uh, we we get. From time to time, we get project students from bachelor. For example, recently we had one student who was from Velour Institute of Technology, and he did his BSc project with us. He actually built up his own CubeSat, one U CubeSat, and we launched it on the balloon. And he wrote the paper, <laughs> and the paper right now is an archive accepted by the archive, and it is there. So. Uh, but at least BSc you need to BSc or BE uh, you need to have. And I think that's very important because there are a lot of students who are from engineering background who would like to apply their skills to yes, something yes. Uh, you know uh, that interesting as space programs and balloons and things like that. So I think that that is of use for the engineering students because we often have a lot of engineering students who come to us who suddenly want to do astronomy <laughs> and. Uh, you know, yeah, they, they and they pick up they pick up astronomy on the way themselves, of course, <laughs> because the same student who did from Velour, he is now in Germany doing MSc in astronomy and oh, astrophysics. Wow. That's so good. That's so nice. That's so interesting. That's very interesting. So um, I would like to encourage the participants to ask some questions. You could ask some questions, or um... oh, they can write to me. And my email is available. Yeah. <laughs> and I so can what's answer. happening to Lucy now? Yes. Yeah, so um, that's what uh, there, there was. There is an organization which is called International Lunar Observatory Association. And they actually flying uh, next year with NASA, a small telescope to the moon. So we proposed, I sent them the documents on Lucy and, uh, and NATS. So now they're considering us. For the flight so that is one that is it one hope i okay. that we have but lucy still has hopes <laughs> uh, what's the weight of the lucy and 
1.3 kilograms and the size how how big is it what kind of a uh, what are the dimensions oh okay uh, so the size is uh, look is aperture the opening of the telescope the, the actually size of the mirror is about 8 cm so you can imagine that uh, it is it is so light because the tube the basic tube is built from cfrp carbon reinforced polymer so that is why it is so light it is very sturdy very strong and it is very light so dimensions maximum it's about 50 cm length and as i said 8 mm 8 cm uh, the mirror the aperture that's pretty big not <laughs> well it's a bit longer a little bit longer than uh, my hand yes not very big <laughs> and how do you control the orientation and all do, you, do they use gyroscopes and all to control the uh, i mean positioning it and other things no with all the constraints uh, on the lander uh, on the team in the lander we eventually decided to put it into zenith so it will look at at zenith mm -hmm. of course that depends on the uh, where the lander was supposed to land actual actual lander because uh, it all depends on the how the sky, uh, the sun goes in the sky so we do not want the sun to shine directly into into the aperture so the orientation could have been anything between uh, zenith to about 75 degrees mm, above the ground and 75 degrees is also very important because of so called uh, zodiacal light which sc uh, scattered uh, light from the dust so we and the lunar horizon glow which was actually detected first by the apollo missions so we didn't want to look at at that scattered light so we need to look in the sky so it's about from 90 to 75 degrees Uh, and when the sun is crossing say over it will you do you have to shade it up do you have to cover it to uh, protect it from uh, excess of radiation no that, uh, that uh, the, we cannot cover it because that door is one one time door so okay the only solution is to switch it off we would just would not operate okay and it has sensors which will do that The sensors, the sensors are, yeah, it, because it has communication with the lander. It's supposed to have communication with the lander, so we can program. Okay. We know we know lunar sky also very well, so we know when the sun would be crossing. That's right. Okay, thank you. That was an interesting talk. Very nice. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, I don't see any questions. So I'll ask you what is the main thing we were talking about: women in science. So what's your message to young girls and women who are thinking of careers in science? <laughs> well, my uh, advice to young girls and women just to go on and do what you want, whether it is electronics or it is engineering. Don't be afraid. Girls can do anything. they can be scientists physicists theoretical physicists or engineers and build as you know yourself the perseverance the lady behind it is actually a lady i mean she's a lady not only <laughs> she's indian she's a she's a woman also that's right yeah yeah so actually even in the indian space program you do have a lot of women in world which is also there which happens yes. with the perseverance thing also right so yes yes women are already you know into it very much into it so girls yeah. shouldn't be scared of any electronics or any engineering yeah i don't know why why is the psychological thing put into them that you know you won't be able to handle that yeah unfortunately and, there is such thing here yeah. during the school times it happens yes yeah yeah but that's absolutely not to fear that's that's true that's true so <clears throat> I don't see any more questions but uh, the lecture will be put up on YouTube it's already rather there on YouTube so please add your questions whenever you want and Rita will always answer them right yes. so thank you so much thanks a lot Rita for such a lovely talk i really liked it it was very really thank nice. you thank you for inviting thanks a lot and
So thanks so much and uh, see you. Take care. Bye-bye.